the meeting of the Board of Trustees of the Fullerton Joint Union High School District. And uh, Jenna Bining, will you lead us in the flag salute to e this evening? And please remain standing after for a moment of silence, please. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask that you um, remain standing for a moment of silence in memory of one of our former employees who's passed away. And that is Julian Ballard, who was hired by the district on July 24th, 1995 as a permanent classified employee. During his tenure, Mr. Ballard served as a custodian and grounds worker at Troy High School, where he completed 21 years of service with the district. The district recently received news that Mr. Ballard passed away at the age of 60. Sympathy and support are offered to the family and friends of Julian Ballard. Please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, because we are doing this on uh, Zoom for the public, I believe we need to take attendance of the board, uh, Mrs. Harder. Okay, okay, Mrs. Bushy, Ms. Klasker, Ms. Holly, Dr. Jang, and Vicki Calhoun, and our student board member are all present. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, acknowledgement of correspondence to the board or any of the board members have any correspondence they'd like to acknowledge. Okay, seeing none, we'll move ahead. Next is um, 2.4, which is approval of the agenda. Um, I'm looking for a motion to approve the agenda with as amended. And um, 6.2.1, 6.2.2, 6.2.3, 6 have been amended. And the copies of these amended items are on the district website under news and announcements board meeting for the public if they're interested. So with that in mind, I'd like a motion for the amended agenda. Okay, moved by Lauren Klatsker, seconded by Vicki Calhoun. Any questions or comments? All in favor, please say aye, or uh, I guess sorry. we need a roll call vote again. I'm sorry. Ready. <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Bushy. Yes. Ms. Klasker. Aye. Ms. Foley. Aye. Dr. Jang. Aye. And Dr. Calhoun. Aye. Thank you. And Jenna, uh, a little reluctantly, I will ask if you'd like to uh, Sir, give a preferential vote. I approve. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next is a call for a motion and a second to approve the following minutes. We have one regular board meeting and then we have a special board meeting on February 23rd. And we were all present for those two meetings, including Jenna. So I was gonna separate that out from the two special meetings where Jenna was not present, if that's okay. So I look for a motion for Approval of the February 9th and the February 23rd. I move to approve the minutes of February 9th and February 23rd. Is there a yeah. second? I second. Second. Moved by John Foley, seconded by Chester Jang. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Mrs. Mrs. Bushy. Mrs. Bushy? Yes. Ms. Glasker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jang? Aye. Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. Okay, now I would look for a motion to approve. I didn't ask you, Jenna, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're all good, I approve. Thank you very much. All right, now we need a motion to approve the minutes of the two special board meetings, March 2nd and March 4th. I see Vicki moving. I move. Okay, is there a second? I'll, I'll second. Seconded by Chester. So it was moved by Vicki Calhoun, seconded by Chester Jang. Any questions or comments? All in favor, we need a roll call. Yes, Mrs. Bushy. Aye. Ms. Klatsker. Aye. Ms. Foley. Aye. Dr. J. Aye. And Dr. Calhoun. Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that brings us now to uh, a special part of our meeting, always a report from our student board member. 
Good evening, Superintendent Dr. Scambray, President Bucci, and members of the board. This is my student board member report for February. Uh, for Valentine's Day, Buena Park ASB collected messages from students through a Google form open from February 1st to the 8th. On their new podcast, the school will be reading these messages to share love and encouragement with their student body. As a side note, this podcast idea beca will become a theme throughout this report thanks to Troy for sharing their fabulous idea at our SAC symposium event. Another great idea shared at symposium was teacher buddies from La Habra High School. Buena Park began this initiative last month. Each other ASB members was assigned a teacher to keep in touch with in order to share encouragement and improve communications between students and staff. Fullerton has dropped a podcast called Tribe Talks, including student interviews and fun games. They've continued with their weekly video announcements and have added a new brain break video to the mix. Some examples of these videos include dancing, doodling, talking, or taking a walk and simply doing nothing. This has been a great way to encourage their student body to practice self-care during a very stressful time. Fullerton's executive board applications were due February 19th and their Mr. Fullerton event is coming up on April 1st featuring 11 senior boys. La Habra has begun a new initiative called Highlander Entrepreneurs where they feature a small business run by one of their students on their Instagram each week. To celebrate Valentine's Day, they put on a Senior Sweetheart Spirit Week and collected virtual love notes on their Instagram instead of their usual grams. La Habra has also started their own podcast and has continued their teacher buddy system, which has been great for staff and students across campus. La Vista ASB produced, produced a club rush video to advertise various clubs on campus. This video featured science club, meditation club, esports, GSA, and many other clubs at their school. For their submissions in the district-wide talent show from March 3rd to March 10th, La Vista is accepting talent show video submissions. This will, they will be awarding special prizes to their first, second, and third place winners. Sonora ASB is currently planning Mr. Sonora and homecoming festivities. For Mr. Sonora, they would like to put on a drive-in event, but they are still in the planning stages. For homecoming, they will continue with the normal homecoming spirit week and are brainstorming ideas for, their, for other HOCO related events. To celebrate Black History Month, Sonora posted graphics on their Instagram weekly and also conducted an interview with their principal, Mr. Atkins. You can also expect a Sonora podcast to come out shortly. Sunny Hills ASB dedicated a week of their February class time towards improving their leadership skills. Each committee was assigned an essential leadership quality, and at the end of the week, each group gave a report about the character trait and where they can apply on campus at Sunny Hills. Throughout the month, their ASB helped PTSA advertise spirit wear attire sales, and to honor college signing athletes, a video was created highlighting these players on their, and their accomplishments in high school. On March 15th, Sunny Hills is having a talent show featuring 18 talent acts that will be competing for two spots in the district-wide talent show. The event will take place on Zoom, and if anyone is interested, you're all more than welcome to attend. Troy's ASB has continued with their Troy Story podcast as the creators of the idea, and it's been a big success with their student body. In, fe in February, senior students had the opportunity to nominate three senior boys for their annual THS event. They have since selected a final 10 students for the main event, and it will premiere via YouTube on March 19th. To keep students engaged weekly, Troy ASB posts this or that polls on their Instagram story, and they publish information about the district talent show on February 10th to their social media. Each school has also begun advertising the application for the student board member position for the 2021 to 2022 school year. As a whole, the Student Advisory Council has been actively working to plan our Fullerton Scott Talent district-wide talent show. We have continued our weekly planning meetings with two representatives from each school, and everyone is in the process of finalizing their talent act submissions. This event will take place virtually on April 23rd from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Admissions will cost $10 and will count for five votes. All the proceeds from this event will go back to Fullerton High Schools and Youth in Need, and of course, we'd love to have you all attend. In place of our annual spring community service activity, SAC has devised a plan to bring back, to give back to our community virtually. Each ASB class has been assigned the topic of either medical workers or teachers, and they're currently in the process of brainstorming content ideas for thank you videos. At tomorrow's SAC meeting, we will finalize these plans and hope to create two different videos to send off to medical workers, as well as teachers inside our district for all their hard work on the front lines this year. Thank you, and this concludes my student board member report for February.
Thank you, Jenna. Any comments from the board members? Jenna, that was an amazing report. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you, are you feeling comfortable with the SAC meetings that you've been chairing? Yeah, uh, yes, all our SAC meetings this year have gone well. It was a little difficult to shift to the virtual format, um, but we've actually done a good job at still, you know, being able to share ideas and also still have ASB students make those connections and those friendships across the district. So yeah, they've actually gone really well this year. Oh, that's good. Well, I certainly look forward to the talent show. That's going to be one of the fun things. <laughs> yes, it will definitely be good. Okay, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. All right. Um, Next are the school reports, uh, Dr. Scambry. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Uh, first up, from La Habra High School, we have Matt Eels. Nope, you're good. Thank you, Dr. Scambray and uh, President Bushi, members of the board. It is an honor to be in person this evening, which is rather nice. La Habra High School is working hard as we wind down the third quarter. Athletics is up and running, and it is great to see athletes back competing. However, it is not just athletes that are competing. We are so proud of our Science Olympiad team that competed this past weekend, and team captain Lauren Krynan for all of their hard work and a huge congratulations to Caitlin uh, Conisi for her first place win in home horticulture. ASB is preparing for elections for next year's executive board while theater is presenting a Zoom performance on March 12th of bad auditions on camera. This performance follows theater's uh, participation in Read Across America where they recorded themselves performing a skit to the book, The Day the Crayons Quit, in which then they shared it with local elementary schools. NJROTC had a successful annual military inspection led by Commander Ballister and First Gunnery Sergeant White, as well as Company Commander Cadet Lieutenant Commander Odalis Garcia. Facilities continue to be a focus as we enhance the landscape of our campus with some recently uh, recently dressing up some of our windows, and we are very excited about the ongoing improvements to our eSports lab, where students will be able to compete in a state-of-the-art facility. Finally, Highlanders would like to congratulate Dr. Sylvia Kaufman for being named Access Central Administrator of the Year for our region. Thank you, and this concludes my report. Okay, next up, Principal of Sonora High School. Marvin Atkins. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Scambray, Board President Bushi, board members, and student representative. It is my pleasure to stand before you today at our last leadership meeting. We focused on the topics that make Sonora a place of excellence in education. We thought about our IB students who are conducting labs and collecting data to complete their internal assessments. We also thought about our ag students who are wrapping up the successful celebration of future farmers of America in our district and at Sonora High School since 1967. Our FFA students were able to celebrate their past, present, and look towards their future. Speaking of their future, there are two Sonora FFA students Matthew Mehta and Savannah Grove, who are running for regional FFA office to represent over 17,000 members. I would like to thank our counseling department for exemplifying their level of excellence in, uh, with our current and incoming raters. We enrolled all of our current students using Google Forms, and we have held Future Raider Night, which introduced our incoming students uh, to us and began their online ARIES enrollment process. We look forward to being their academic home. As many are winding down for spring break, Sonora, along with our sister schools, are gearing up for our athletic programs in a very safe and responsible way. Our undefeated cross-country team has set the standard of excellence. 
We are wishing all of our sports much success as they begin within the next week or so. And we invite all of you to come out and see the Mitre Raiders compete. Equability teaching practices, high standards, rigor, and supportive system of family are just a few of the characteristics that make Sonora High School a place of excellence in education. Thank you. This concludes my board report. Thank you, Marvin. Next up from Troy High School, Will Minster. Thank you, Dr. Scambray, President Bushy, and members of the board. We are very grateful to have students back in school and for them to have the opportunity to have athletic competitions once again. Seeing our football team scrimmage last week really drives home how different this year has been and how much we have missed due to the pandemic. We are excited for our athletes to be able to participate. And this week we have cross country, football, soccer, baseball, softball, and water polo. There is more to come with indoor sports soon, having the opportunity to also compete. Thank you to all of our athletes for never giving up and our coaches, district and school staff for providing the guidance and support to enable these opportunities. Um, today, I also had the opportunity to observe our annual military inspection, AMI, held for the first time in the virtual world in our hybrid model. And for example, the pass and review was pre-recorded. Um, US Navy Rear Admiral Nowakowski was in the Zoom with our NGRTC to preside over the AMI this year. The Admiral was very impressed with our cadets program in school and is looking forward to being able to make an in-person visit, hopefully in the near future. Uh, Troy defending Science Olympiad national champions last weekend won the Southern California Regionals and won the event with 59 points. Uh, Northwood High School was the next closest team with 132 points and like golf, the low score wins. Um, 59 is a very low score, by the way, for one of these competitions. Uh, Troy is marching forward towards a fourth consecutive national championship with a gap year last year due to the COVID pandemic, and there was no competition. Uh, Troy senior Jack Tan, a California Scholarship Federation member, has been selected as the recipient for the 2021 Mitchelson Memorial Award and will be awarded $1,000. Uh, this Glenn Mitchelson Memorial Award was established in 2012 in memory of the late Glenn Mitchelson, who was a strong advocate of the CSF model promoting community service. Upon his passing, Glenn's family bequeathed funds to CSF for an annual essay contest in Glenn's honor to open to high school CSF seniors who have a passion for service. We are almost through the third quarter. We are looking forward to having a strong spring as all of us are seeing the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. Thank you to our parents, teachers, counselors, school support staff, superintendent, cabinet, and the board for always supporting Troy High School and helping us continue to do what's best for kids. Thank you, and this concludes my report. Thank you, Will. Next up from Buena Park High School, Sanji Berg. Thank you, Dr. Scambray, President Bushi, and members of the board. It is so exciting to have students and staff back on campus, to have the students engaging in their activities and to start competing in athletics, like you've heard from my colleagues. Um, our boys and girls water polo teams have both started off the season three and one, so that's very exciting. And while we eagerly await the start to the spring season for most of the other sports, we'd like to congratulate our girls cross country team for placing second in the freeway league and finishing up their season with a four and one record. So that was fantastic for those girls. Um, it's a young team uh, who train and run as a pack. So that's a pun intended there. But the best part is that they're also a scholar, a scholar athlete team with a collective GPA above 4.0. During the past month, we've also had dozens of students participating in various speech competitions from multiple community organization events to larger regional competitions through FFA. We even have some first place finishers moving on to the state rounds later this month. Two of our Air Force JROTC Stellar Explorer academic teams qualified for nationals. And so they'll be competing in mid-April. And I'd like to recognize Lillian uh, Rios on her first place finish in the category of 2D design during the recent district art show that was held at the Muckenthaler. And I was so glad that they hosted that event and allowed us to go see our students art on displays. So that was really um, awesome of them. And lastly, I'd like to recognize Mr. Robert Shetland for being selected as District Teacher of the Year. He is our band director and does a phenomenal job with our students. And thank you, President Bushi and Dr. Scambray for uh, coming out and surprising him 
about a week and a half ago. That was a lot of fun. And thank you. And that concludes my March board report. Thank you, Sanji. Next up from La Vista La Sierra, Sandy Liana. Thank you, Dr. Scambray, President Bushi, members of the board. This is the time of year where I typically report on the success of the Adult Transition Program Careers Day event and the La Vista La Sierra Community College Fair. These in-person events were of course canceled this year due to COVID, but our weekly Zoom seminars with local job training, community college and adult living programs have been very well attended. These in-person events were of course canceled, but overall we think that there's more students have access to the plethora of options available to them after graduation through these weekly virtual presentations. And this will definitely shape the way we plan for college career events in the future. We're still in the process of virtually administering the LPAC test to our 231 English learners. Good news, 81% of our students have completed portions or all of the exam, and we have a plan in place for the other 19%. Ultimately, the lessons we learned from LPAC will help us administer the upcoming CASP more smoothly. This Friday marks the end of the third quarter, which will be graduation day for 40 students at La Vista, KWB, and the ICRA Online Academy. These students will now get an early start on their next steps to college, career, and adult life, and we wish them the best. In closing, we're super proud of Sylvie Long Lottieri, the La Sierra High School teacher who was named the Code District Teacher of the Year. Sylvie is an enthusiastic ATP teacher, as I think our visitors noticed on the day that came and surprised us, and she will represent our district well in the county competition. Thank you, and that concludes the La Vista La Sierra report. Thank you, Sandy. Next up from Fullerton, Laura Rubio. Good evening, Dr. Scambray, President Bucci, members of the board. It's great to see everybody in person today. Um, Fullerton Union High School has had a great reopening of schools. Our teachers are hard at work trying to support our students as best as they can, and our students are doing their best to keep up with all of their work, especially as the quarter grades are coming up soon. I am very proud of our staff and students for continuing to persevere. We are thankful that as a community, we are doing better and are very thankful that we can finally start opening up sports for competition. Just like my colleagues, we love to see the students out there and competing. We also had a scrimmage on, on Saturday and it was great to be on the field. We are seeing amazing matches already by our athletes and these last few months of conditioning and practice are definitely paying off. They thank you very much for all of your support as we open up. I would like to congratulate our speech and debate students who placed at the California High School Speech Association's championship. Our tradition of success continues. Placing in their respective matches were the following students, uh, Kennedy Hetz, Kylie Gong, Mackenzie Malden, who actually was the first timer in, in this competition, Emily Heying, Evelyn Ishikawa, Garrett Fan, Audrey Bay, and Isaiah Jung. The state competitions will take place April 23rd and 24th, so we're looking forward to more great news from our speech and debate team. Also, I would like to invite you to log on and see our visual arts show called Sustained Investigation. Our show is featured on our visual arts website. Please go on and enjoy some of the great artwork by our talented students. I would also like to thank our PTSA for trying to also stay connected with each other and with our parents. They have been hosting a couple of online bingo nights at no charge if you're a PTSA member. And I've heard they are lots of fun and parents get together and, and talk about a variety of things, school included, but they are a great way for parents to stay connected um, with FUHS. So I would like to thank them for their, for their efforts for sure. And again, thank you very much and for your support. And that concludes my board report. Thank you, Laura. And finally, from Sony Hills High School, Alan Witten. Thank you, Dr. Scambury. President Bushy, members of the board, uh, with sports opening up these last two weeks, Sunny Hills has a renewed energy and it's great to feel some of the Sunny Hills excitement on campus that we've been missing. Uh, we're also excited that we're starting to receive a few phone calls from our cohort C students opting to transition to A and B. Not a lot, but a few and it's encouraging and I think it's just adding to that energy and the more they feel that the more we get a few more kids, I think it's just going to hopefully continue to trend in that direction. 
I'd like to compliment my LPAC team. Our English learners have completed 87% of the three-part LPAC test and the oral portion is underway. We're receiving outstanding support from Ed Services and the district office. I very much appreciate that. A new fun trend that we're seeing is colleges are reaching out to our juniors to do virtual campus tours. And uh, that's something that we're seeing happen more and more. And I think it's a great way to get our kids excited and interested in college and out there uh, visiting. So that's that's a new trend we're, we're starting to see. And last, we're starting to reach out to our incoming ninth grade class. And currently our incoming families are creating their ARIES accounts and selecting their classes for next year. And this is always really a fun, exciting time to get those freshmen and their families so excited about high school. Thank you, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Alan. Good job, principals. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the board? I have a couple of um, questions, actually, and you know, maybe Linda Harder could lead me and the other board members to this, how we could access the theater production at La Habra that is coming up on the 12th, and then uh, how we access the talent show, there must be links, They're probably on your websites, but there must be an easy way for us to do that. Um, and then also the visual arts website, uh, I would be interested in connecting with that too. Probably on your district newsletters would be a place to go for those, those things. And again, I know I say this every time, but I really thank you for the, the weekly newsletters. I am always amazed at how much is going on, even though we have the virus. So it's it's just it's just so impressive. Um, Mrs. Bushi, I'll uh, get that information to all the board members. I'll send an email and collect it all up. And that would be great. Sure. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I wanted to say was at the last board meeting when you guys weren't here. Uh, we were each given a gift from the FFA, uh, from the various schools. It was really beautiful. It's a, a cutting board. Mine happened to have the Sonora Raider Ranch embossed on it. I don't know whether you had other schools on yours, but it really was, it was just so pretty. And I wanted you to pass that on to your Ag FFA people, how meaningful that was. It was really nice. We didn't get to celebrate with them this year as we normally do, but they didn't forget about us in spite of that. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, <clears throat> and it was mentioned by a couple of you, uh, Dr. Scambray and Carl Zehner and I went to the to three schools for the employee of the year. And you know, I maybe, I mean, you are all on the campuses a lot. I have not been, unfortunately. And maybe when you're deprived of something and you go, you appreciate it so much and the little things. But I wanted to tell you um, how impressed I was with what we saw with the people and with the facilities. <clears throat> we went to Buena Park first and uh, we met the, the teacher out on the lawn. And um, I mean, he was, he was, it was interesting how all three accepted it with a different um, demeanor, if you will. And he was, he was so cute. It was kind of like, you know, I'm really not surprised at this. You know, I've worked for it and so forth. But the, um, the thing that struck me was the lawn at Buena Park High School looked like fake grass. It was so beautiful, which is certainly a compliment to our grounds workers, all the work that they do. We went to Sonora. I had been in the lobby of Sonora for a while. I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous. And they met in the theater, which of course is beautiful with the upgrades. And I was impressed with the technology setup, which was a demonstration of how it's working for the teachers, you know, in their classrooms. I really appreciated uh, the little lesson I got from Carl Zehner in the, the camera use and so forth. And then lastly, <clears throat> we went to La Vista High School and uh, well, the, t uh, the custodian at, at Sonora was, kind of embarrassed and shy in the way that he accepted the honor. <clears throat> so then we went to La Vista, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, Scott and Carl and I hid in the book closet while they brought the teacher in. And uh, so she's sitting down, she was so cute. She was expecting that they were gonna take a group picture of all the teachers of the year. 
she had somebody help her with her makeup and her hair and all. She was adorable. So we popped out of this crowded, <laughs> cluttered book closet. She was so excited. I thought she was going to with balloons. Yeah, with balloons. <laughs> anyway, she was so excited. Um, anyway, it was it was just so interesting the way every school has their own way of honoring people and doing things. But it was just it was just so much fun to be there. I wanted to thank everybody for that opportunity. So anyway, I usually don't have a lot of chatter at this point in the meeting, but I just was really impressed and wanted to share with all of you. Scott, do you want to tell us about Sylvia's honor? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. I was, um, unfortunately, my thunder was somewhat stolen by Mr. Eels. <laughs> we will be discussing that tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, Matt. <laughs> May cost you lunch. Uh, Sylvia, would you like to come up here? It is my honor to announce that Sylvia Kaufman, Assistant Superintendent of Education and Assessment Services, was selected by AXA Region 17 as the recipient of the 2021 Administrator of the Year in the Central Office category. can't think of a more well-deserved deserving person um, and uh, from AXA in addition to be se selected as administrator of the year central office category Dr. Kaufman has made it to the final round of consideration by AXA statewide awards. Dr. Kaufman was selected as a region finalist for AXA statewide awards in category E central office administrator of the year. The awards committee is currently reviewing all state finalist nominations and will make the selections this month. Out of more than 250 state finalists, only 200, only 25 individuals will be chosen for state recognition throughout California, representing candidates from all 19 AXA regions. So, Sylvia, congratulations, well deserved. Thank you for everything you Thank do you. for us. Thank you, Scott. That was very nice. Congratulations, Dr. Kaufman. <clears throat> okay, next is update from employees in the PTA associations. And uh, first we have FSTO president, Angie Senkak. I have to remember to unmute myself. Good evening, President Bruschi trustees and Dr. Scambray. I'd like to start with an update from FSTO's negotiating team tonight. We have met with the district's negotiating team several times over the previous months and we've settled on two articles thus far, Article 3, Definitions, and Article 26, Procedures for Reporting Child Abuse. We are awaiting counter proposals that have been sent to the district's negotiating team for several articles and we look forward to our session together tomorrow. Many of our FSTO members have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, and several have also, are also on track to receive their second vaccine very soon. Many of these have been done through the OC Department, Orange County Department of Ed Pod, through appointments with CVS and Walgreen pharmacies, as well as Kaiser Permanente, and some even through the city of Long Beach. We look forward to the day when all of our members who are wanting a vaccination will finally receive one. We can then move to a more to more a more semblance of a normal school year and schedules, whatever normal is. I'd like to also, uh, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, President Bushi and Trustee Folly for joining us on our February 16th Representative Council meeting and giving us their time. It was great to hear from them both and they were gracious with their time and even took questions from our members. Their time is so appreciated. We look forward to hosting Dr. Calhoun in our to our upcoming March 16th Representative Council meeting, and we will enjoy hearing from her as our newest trustee. Dr. Jang and Trustee Klatsker will join us during our April 20th Representative Council meeting, and we look forward to hearing from them as well. 
Thank you all for meeting with our members, for taking time to hear us, and for taking time to allow us to voice some of our concerns. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Angie. Uh, next up is CSEA President uh, Joe Slaker. Good evening, Dr. Scambry, President Bucci, and members of the board. I, I want to apologize for the lighting and any background noise that might be here tonight, but I'll make it brief. Um, I wanted to announce that the uh, Fullerton High Chapter 82 of CSEA has ratified our reopener contract with the district with a 95% yes vote. Um, I think this is a clear message that our membership is happy with the result of our negotiations. I want to thank Dr. Atkinson and his team again for the cooperative nature of our meetings. And we look forward to our upcoming successor contract negotiations in the near future. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Joe. And next, um, we have an update from the course. Fullerton Council PTA. And were you going to read that? We yes, I'm, yes, I'm going to read it for them. Um, uh, they submitted it and asked me to read it. So I'm going to read for them. So good evening, everyone. We again hope everyone is healthy and safe as we continue to progress through the school year. We are also happy to hear that the vaccines are available and being administered to teachers and staff members. We at Fullerton Council PTA are continuing with some of our regular spring activities. Our annual election meeting will be held on March 30 and all of our units will be having their elections this month or next month as well. It is also scholarship season for our graduating seniors. Fullerton Council PTA offers scholarships to, se to seniors who are PTA members and who will be continuing their education over the next several years. Scholarship applications and instructions are available with the school counseling departments. Thank you all. Thank you for all that you continue to do for our students, and we hope to see everyone in person soon. Wendy Reed, Christy Carter, and the Fullerton Council PTA Board. Thank you, Mrs. Harder. Uh, next, um, if, if ever anybody wants to say something, just make a noise. I, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing the wrong direction here. Uh, next, uh, public comments, and I was told we have no public comments, or did we get some? Um, yes, we do have one oh, public have comment, one. Okay. and um, Weston will let him in. Okay, great. Hello. Um, I would like to express my concerns for our district, specifically on how to make the mental health of our students and teachers a priority without compromising the quality of our education provided. I'm here to promote, propose asynchronous learning on Wednesdays. Let's address the main concerns of asynchronous learning, that the teachers and students will not be working on these days. The students that do not work during regular Zoom meetings or regular school will continue to not work. However, those that have been working during quarantine will continue to work with their diligence. Asynchronous learning will always favor the students. They can take breaks that are more favorable and reasonable to them or are better for their schedule and can work without having their face uncomfortably streamed to 30 other students for five or more consecutive hours. The concern that teachers will regard asynchronous day as a day off work presents the same scenario as the students, where they will continue to work with the same level of professionalism. Students will still be able to require and submit work by time benchmarks, while teachers will still have to be available via Zoom for each class period. Additionally, asynchronous learning serves as respect to the students, as this learning shows that the district understands the students' needs by allowing students to work in a way that is more complementary to their mental and emotional needs at this time. Key benefits of asynchronous include flexibility, practicality, and convenience. Not only do we have more flexibility when we work, it is also more practical as we can set our own limits instead of being bound to Zoom. Plus, it is also more convenient. One of the goals of FJUHSD is incorporating the flipped classroom approach to education, which specifies that students learn independently at home and teachers utilize class time for review and further learning. Asynchronous learning signs with, aligns with that philosophy. Most importantly, asynchronous serves as a mental break because the student no longer has to stay on Zoom for five to eight hours and can instead learn from their own comfort. Those that don't want to socialize on Zoom that have their cameras off or dislike breakout rooms may feel more comfortable or focused when being able to learn independently. Our students are currently failing at unprecedented numbers this school year and numbers of mental health related issues have spiked across the district. So I ask, what are we doing to help these students? And thank you for your time. 
Um, for the record, please, I forgot to ask if you could please state your name. Oh, sorry. My name is Michael Yamaguchi. Thank you. Thank you very much. And was that the only um, we had? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, next, um, we have 5.1.1, which is an action item. And this regards uh, nominations to delegate assembly and the opportunity the board has to, um, to uh, put forth a vote. And it's not an individual, it would be the collective vote uh, from the board. Um, I would offer a suggestion and we can go from there. Uh, having worked with the incumbents, they've all been there, done their job, they're very responsive. So my inclination at the outset, there are seven of them, is to uh, elect the seven uh, incumbents. Um, I have some comments about the others, but I, there was not one that jumped out that said, you know, this, this might be a good person to add. So unless you guys have looked at the applications and have come up with something else. I looked at their you know, what they've done as a board member, I looked at their years of service, looked at their application, that kind of thing, so. Yes, uh, uh, President Bushy, I agree. I looked over all the applications and um, while we could vote for two others, I didn't necessarily see two that really sprung ahead of the pack of remaining applicants. And so it would be challenging to figure out who to add. So I concur um, with the, your, um, you know, a thought process to select the incumbents and, and no additional people. Is that correct? Am I understanding? That's what I was suggesting, unless there were any that jumped out to you as, as possible. So the only one, well, there was one board member who's been a board member for a long time. She's done the masters in governments, which is usually an indication that you're serious about, you know, what you're doing. But uh, I was still sticking with the incumbents, I guess. Yeah, I thought they were all had good qualifications. Like I said, I just didn't see where to draw that line to add another two. So I guess for the record, it would be good to have a motion that would, uh, be casting a vote for those names. Would one of you like to do that? Do you have the? You know what? I don't know. I can't remember. I, I was looking and I didn't have, I have it. have it if you don't. Do you want me to read it into the record? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We'll just, yeah, she can pick out the information. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, President Bushy, would you like me to make a motion to that? Effect? That'd be great. Thank you. I move that. Um, we as a board uh, vote for the following people for the California School Board Association Delegate Assembly. Bonnie Castry, Huntington Beach Union High School District. Jackie Philbeck from the Anaheim Elementary School District. Carrie Flanders, Brea Olinda Unified School District. Karen M. Freeman, Placentia Yorba Linda Unified School District. Al Jabbar, Anaheim Union High School District. Charlene Matoyer, Newport Mesa Unified School District. Susie R. Schwartz, Saddleback Valley Unified School District. Is there a second? Okay. It's seconded by Lauren Klatsker. Any other comments? Okay, then we need a roll call vote. Okay, Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Klatsker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jang? Aye. And Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Harder. Uh, next is 5.3.1, which is um, an action item also, and that is the declaration of need for fully qualified educators to authorize the employment of teachers holding emergency permits credentials for the 21-22 school year. Uh, Dr. Atkinson, please. Thank you, President Bushy, member of the board, uh, members of the board tonight, uh, well, actually each year in a regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Trustees, the district must prevent, uh, I'm sorry, present <laughs> and declare its need for fully qualified educators. This allows the district 
uh, to authorize the employment of teachers holding emergency credentials for the coming year. Tonight, I present for approval the district declaration of need for fully qualified educators for the 2021-2022 school year. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Okay, moved by Joanne Pauley, seconded by Vicki Calhoun. Any questions or comments of Dr. Atkinson? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. We need a roll call vote. Uh -huh. Mrs. Bushy. Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. I'm sorry. It's Ms. okay. Bass <laughs> aye. Just testing you. <laughs> Dr. Jang? Aye. And Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank and Jano Bining, would you like to cast a preferential vote? I approve. Thank you very much. All right, next is um, 5.4.1, which is a general obligation refunding bonds presentation. And I think Joan Velasco is going to do that presentation for us. Um, good evening, President Bushi, board members, Dr. Scambri and guests. I'd actually like to introduce Adam Bauer. Um, he is our financial consultant and he'll be presenting some information regarding trying to save our taxpayers some money. Here we go. Thank you. That's funny. I kept looking around the room for someone I didn't know. Or I should have known. <laughs> oh, good. I'm, I'm out here in the, the cyber world waiting, waiting to see you. There you are. Well, sorry, I can't see you all in, per all in person. I always do look forward to going, uh, but Jason Chung and I are both available this evening. And um, as you can see from the cover of your presentation, we prepared this in a very similar format to what we've done in the past. And what we've done in the past with any financing that we're doing, we first bring it to the board as an introduction item versus just bringing it directly to uh, be approved. So that's a, a long-standing practice that district staff has worked with us on. And so this evening, there's no action. What we're looking at having you consider at a future board meeting is the funding of some outstanding bonds. And just to be very clear, the district, uh, the district students or the district um, classrooms and, and staff get no benefit from doing refundings. It's strictly to provide taxpayer savings. So taxpayers had approved geo bond measures, the district had issued those, and then um, built projects. And now when we have the opportunity, we're looking at refinancing that to try to get the lowest cost possible for the taxpayers within the district's boundaries. So if we could turn to the next slide, please. So, you know, why does something like this work? And what we tried, I showed you this slide before, I, this has updated dates on it. But I've described to you the, M, the US Treasury and how that is a benchmark for how a lot of different bonds trade. And in this case, it's especially relevant because in order to refinance these bonds, we're doing them on a taxable basis, just like US Treasuries. And so that red line represents the 30 year US Treasury and the 10 year represents the um, 10 year US Treasury. Now, about two months ago, we were probably getting calls from mortgage brokers, watching TV and seeing all sorts of commercials about refinancing. That's because that US Treasury was very, very low. And then now that has drifted upward, but not too much, but it has drifted upward. So you're probably getting less of those calls. Same kind of concepts apply here is um, many things trade off the US Treasury, especially the 10 year. And so when that's extremely low, we oftentimes can refinance. And so the good thing for us is municipal bonds haven't trended upward in the same fashion that treasuries have. So we still have a longer window than if, if we had issued US treasuries, which we can't, but which is the benchmark that we look towards. So next slide, please. That chart to the top there with the blue bars and the red line, this is a very important chart. So when we sell bonds, we don't just have one interest rate. Uh, we have a one-year rate, a two-year rate, all the way out to 30. And those blue bars represent the range of the interest rates for each one of those maturities. And then the red line represents where we were as of March 1st, 2021. And hopefully what you're noticing is that red line is towards the bottom of those blue bars. 
that signals that we're at very low rates. Now, when we were first looking at this, we were scraping the absolute bottom of those. Um, obviously, it takes time, uh, presentations like this, uh, you know, and to kind of get the whole fi finance team moving. So we weren't able to get at that absolute point. Maybe it'll go back down. But that's where we are now is we're very, very low, but not at the absolute lows. And why is that? Again, I keep kind of saying what causes these things. And I, I like to share that with you is that chart to the far right at the bottom. If it's green, that means money's flowing into the missile bond funds. If it's red, that means money's flowing out of the missile bond funds. And what we aren't able to capture there is last week, money started flowing out again, but at a very small level compared to that red line. That red line right there represents about a year ago when all of us realized we'd be shutting schools, shutting businesses, and our lives to be changing. I don't think we realized how long, but what, that, what happened there was investors, it's called a sell everything rally. They sold stocks, they sold bonds, and all they bought were things like cash type products, like treasuries and, and you know, putting money in your bank account. Um, but then investors realized pretty quickly that things, you know, things were gonna be hard, but as far as the financial instruments go, they were probably gonna be able to weather the storm and they very quickly moved back into things like this. So those are the whys. And now we can go to the next slide, please. So I've talked about the bond market, the municipal market, which is national and to some degree international. And now we're focused just on Fortin Union High School District. And what we're looking at here is the district's assessed value. And we have a, about a small percentage, about 10% of our assessed value that falls within LA County and the majority of our assessed values within Orange County. And so we break that out for you there. But then we also show you is your percentage change in assessed value. And you've had very strong assessed value growth for a very long time. Even in the Great Recession, we decreased by less than 2%. If I could tell most districts throughout the state of California, you only decreased by 2% during the Great Recession, they would be thrilled. Your assessed value is very stable and it's a very positive credit positive. It shows stability within your community and, and also homes that um, folks that haven't turned over their homes in quite some time. So next slide, please. What this slide is, is just all the district's debt that's outstanding when it comes to general obligation bonds. And the one highlighted in blue there, that is our one that we can refinance. And another factor to be able to refinance is not just low rates, but that far right column that says next call date. When, we, when investors buy your bonds, they don't want you to refinance them six months later. So typically you have about a 10 year feature in there where we can't pay them back. And so what we have to do is when we get close to this, have opportunities like now where we refinance it, put money in the escrow and then pay it off on that date. And that's why these are done taxable versus tax exempt. The law requires that you do those taxable. But even with that, even doing it taxable and even putting money in the escrow account, we're at this point, we're still able to achieve significant savings for the taxpayers. And now you'll be hearing about this more. If you see there's a, there's a 25 on there, there's a 27, 28 and 29. Um, the, the most preferred way, way is to be able to team it up with a bond sale and kind of do both at once and get some savings like you've done in the past. But in some cases, like we are now, there's no obvious other transaction to team it up with. And so we're just looking at doing this one on a standalone basis. But like I said, you'll be hearing about refundings uh, all through the um, you know, 2024 through 2030. Next slide, please. Um, the 2002 debt outstanding. So this is your 2002 geo bond measure. And uh, this one's performing exactly like it should. Uh, you have your, um, uh, the far left there shows the amount per 100,000. And then the red bar shows our kind of maximum um, tax rate that we could have. And then the, the aqua and the blue represent the tax rate we're actually consuming. And uh, you know, it's unusual to see this, but it's really good when we do see this, that we have the bar charts are well below that red line. And that means our tax rate is much lower than what was projected for the taxpayer. So a very good sign. Next slide, please. This slide is the one we just issued off of. And in this case, it'd be even more rare to be able to show that we're below our tax rate, not right at it. But fortunately for us, we'd be able to take advantage of low interest rates and 
um, our assessed value has grown at a greater percentage than we um, projected. And so we are, it doesn't, you can barely notice it, but we're below that red line just slightly. Um, and that certainly is a positive. The other thing I'd say is many uh, non-unified districts target a $30 per 1,000. That's the maximum you can pursue. If you recall, we're only targeting a 19. And so once again, that's an example of uh, Fortin having uh, lower tax rates than many of your other peers would have. Next slide, please. So this is the refunding uh, in front of us. Uh, now, like I said, interest rates have moved away from us to some degree, but not enough that this still doesn't look uh, like an attractive refinancing. Um, if you, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of numbers here, but if we focus on gross savings, that 150,000 or so, that's the amount that's being say that the taxpayer is saving each year, but we're not getting all those savings year one. We're getting between now and 2029. So it's important to apply a net present value factor, basically bring that to what current dollars would look like. And that is that um, uh, 1,168,000 was shown there on the far right. Um, and then, so we try to show annual savings, net present value. Uh, generally, when we look at refinancings, yeah, since they come in all different shapes and sizes, one of the things we look towards a lot is, what is that net present value savings percentage? And generally, if it's over 5%, it's worth giving strong consideration to. And as you can see there at 7.68, we still have pretty healthy savings over that 5%. In a lot of cases, districts do them as low as 3%. Um, so just to give you some perspective on where we stand compared to those. Next slide, please. On our last slide, uh, what we tried to break out here is we're introducing this to you this evening. Um, we are now, uh, you know, uh, we're, hopefully we'll continue to move forward and we have a, a rating presentation. We've talked to you a bit about this. That's where district staff presents uh, the, some of the economic data, um, some of the um, financial data of the district and we get a rating assigned to us so the investors kind of know what category we fall within. Um, and then uh, we hope to bring it back to the board for that consideration of the resolution of issuance on April 13th. And at that point, you would have taken an action to allow district staff to move forward within the parameters that we've identified in that resolution. And then finally, we'd have a sale on uh, April 21st. Hopefully you notice a key word in there, a competitive sale. A lot of districts don't um, do this. They do a negotiated bond sale. We hired an underwriter in advance. And that would that if that underwriter is involved, it can certainly be a great result because they've been working with us all along. But at the, when we did this new measure, one of the things we did was we started doing competitive bond sales. And what we do there is we bid these out to the underwriter that bids the lowest cost for your taxpayers. And you've had overwhelming level of success. We've done this with a lot of Orange County districts. We're working with Garden Grove, Irvine Unified, Santa Ana, all the other districts that I just mentioned there also done very well. But Fortin was one of the earlier ones to do some of these. Um, and then finally, we have uh, on May 5th, 2021 is our closing. And that's the day that we can say that we successfully locked in those savings for taxpayers. Um, so we're certainly watching interest rates. If they trend away from us too much, I might be saying something different to you on April 13th. Um, but so far, the rates have held. And today was a good day. Rates declined a bit. So with that, uh, both Jason and I are available for any questions. I know I cover a lot of ground. Thank you very much. Uh, any board members have any questions or comments? I have, uh, I have a few. Um, one, a comment, I think, uh, with regard to the bonds, the, bo the board, when they were, you know, when this began, one of the very important things was being fair to the homeowners. And I think we have held up our end of the bargain when we refinanced, it's been to the financial advantage of our homeowners. So I just wanted to point that out and I'm very grateful for the support from the bond managers, for the financial managers. Um, one thing you said was that there's no benefit to the district to do this. The benefit is to the people that are paying. Uh, is there any disadvantage to the district for doing this? Uh, time. Uh, your staff is uh, focused on uh, everyday changes uh, in the pandemic world, um, and it takes staff time to do this. And so it's a, an additional commitment that they take on. And your time. We're on your agenda tonight, and we're on, on your agenda on the 13th. So 
it just has to mix in there with all your other priorities. Thank you. Does uh, does doing this extend the the amount of time that it takes to pay back? I guess Great. I didn't quite. Great question. Refundings are oftentimes compared to uh, refinancings of a home mortgage, which most of the time people keep doing 30, 30, 30 until they get close to retiring. In this, in geo bonds, no, we are not, we, we are not, and we are not able to extend the maturities on a refunding. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think those were my only questions. I appreciate your uh, very clear report. And I love that we got an update this afternoon. Uh, I guess one more question, we're looking like a month out before this would actually take place. And you said, and I think you answered this question already, you said if there's a, a change in the rates, then you would be saying something different. So you'll be watching this and looking for the advantage um, that you're yeah. presenting. So, you know, we don't want to do a transaction. You don't, we don't want to, and you wouldn't want to do a transaction just to, because we started it. If we aren't going to get to savings thresholds that are, you know, have a significant benefit to taxpayers, then we just stop. And maybe we come back and I report that rates have moved away from us. We might be talking about this again a year from now. Um, so it's, it's really about if rates stay close to where they are today, we have a great deal to do. If they continue to move where they move to the same level they moved in the last two weeks, then we'd be saying we probably want to hold off on this. But um, like I said, we did see some signs so far. It's been two days this week, but we have seen signs this week that things have calmed down. If they stay in that mode, then we have a great deal to look at. Okay, thank you. Any questions pop up since we've been talking? Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Bauer. I appreciate your um, wonderful report and thank you for giving extra work for our, our employees. <laughs> I, I had to be honest about that question. <laughs> the, the, board be, the board meeting is a, a, minor, a minor thing. It's the work on our staff, but I know they, they do a good job. So thank you, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And we'll look, hear, look forward to hearing from you in a little bit. All right, um, let's move on to um, action item 5.4.2, which is a certification of the second interim financial report for the fiscal year 2021. And Joan Velasco is going to do that. The one that's gonna get all this extra work. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, it's that time again to bring back another report to you. Our second interim report goes through and gives you a financial update through January 31st of this year. Bust in, it's not moving. There we go, sorry about that. So um, you can see here that we've already brought the first interim to you and now we're looking at the second interim numbers. After this report, we'll be coming back again with our estimated actuals and actually starting to talk about the budget for next year. So we're always um, looking at where we are and where we're going to. I guess I don't have a heavy thumb. So here is our revenues um, as of January 31st. Overall, we have $183 million in our general fund. And you can see that over 76% of our money is actually coming from the LCFF, which is directly from the state. We receive about 10% of federal monies, 8% from state. The local 6% money that we receive is to fund our SELPA, our special education program. And we do transfer in $805,000 from a different fund. And where we're spending this money is um, about $187 million. And overall, you can see 73% of our budget goes to our salaries and our benefits. We have books and supplies that we purchase for 8% of our budget or 15 million. Services and other operatings around 12% of our budget or 22 million. Capital outlays 2% or 4.1 million. Other outgo 4.9 million or 3% of the budget. And we're transferring out $3.2 million or 2% of our budget. So we always want to talk a little bit about what did we talk about at first interim and what are we talking about now and what are those changes? So you can see here that at first interim for our revenues, it only um, increased by a very small amount. 
And that was due to our change in our unduplicated count. We look at that unduplicated count, which is down quite a bit from the year before, but it did go up a little bit from the time that we presented at first interim. And so um, it's nice to see though, that it's at least stable here. Our expenditures went um, actually down a little bit by 648,000. And the reason for this is that it's been an unusual year and we went through our budgets and we were looking at items that we had budgeted in that we didn't think would really pan out 100%. So some of those items were hourly or overtime hours because of the district pretty much being closed down. Um, we're not seeing a lot of costs in those areas. So we actually went in and dropped the budget. So overall, a $937,000 increase to the ending fund balance. For our restricted program, um, we did receive an additional $858,000. And that was from the ESSA money that we received. And uh, we had allocated so much at first interim, but when the final numbers came through, we received a little bit more. And because these are restricted programs, what we receive, we also turn around and spend. And so we uh, increased our expenses by 878,000. So just a net adjustment of $20,000. What we were doing with those increased expenses was we had some additional sub agreements for special ed and also some additional increases in our operational costs, our professional services and some communication expenses. So, we want to talk a second here about our ending fund balance. And you can see here, we keep a small amount in our revolving cash in our stores, or our inventory. This gives you a breakdown of what we're anticipating our ending fund balances to be in our restricted programs. We do um, have some lottery money that we're putting aside here for future um, textbook adoptions. And our state mental health, we're going to have a reserve here also. We are looking at that money to see how we can be using it to support our students. And so that ending fund balance could change a little bit. And then we still have a small amount of money left in our classified employee professional development grant of around 20,000 and very small money in those other two restricted programs. We keep a million dollars of the unrestricted money for contingencies in case something happens in the district and we can go and grab that to spend. And the 3% is the, um, minimum reserve that we have to have in this district, which is right around $5.6 million. So what that does is leave the unassigned amount of about $40 million. Overall, the ending reserve in this district is 26%. So it's a very strong um, number that we are looking at here. Now we wanna talk a minute about multi-year projections. So um, whenever we present a report, we always have to talk about the current year and then the next two years out. So taking a look overall, and there's much more detail if you actually go through the report itself. But in summary, you can see um, in 21-22, which is going to be our next year, we actually received a COLA of 3.84%. That COLA might change a little bit. We're gonna go back and listen to what the governor's new budget will be in May. And obviously that will be adjusted. Um, and then we're anticipating our expenses to be around 131 million. A little bit is, uh, you can see a decline there in the expenses, but really what that's for is that we had carryover from last year that we brought into this year. That's one-time money and once that's spent, it's gone. So we drop our budget next year because that money's not going to be in there. Then we increase our budget for step and column. We increased it 2% for health and welfare. And on our books and supplies, we have consumer price index because costs go up of around 1.57%. Same situation in 22-23. I wish that COLA was a little bit more, but right now we're being told 1.28% for 22-23. Um, this one's interesting though, because we are going to get hit in that year for declining enrollment. We talked a little bit about this at first interim. We were given a waiver, and so we're not being hurt for our attendance, but in the 22-23 year, that waiver is now gone. So we're basically going to get hit for drop in attendance for the prior two years. In addition, we have um, our unduplicated count has been very low this year. 
So we're anticipating that going up next year and the year after, but at a slower pace than where we started from last year. So um, that's the unrestricted. You can see here in 22-23, our ending balance is going to be roughly 44.6 million. And then looking at the restricted program, you can see the revenues dropping next year quite a bit. We did receive quite a bit of money from the CARES Act, our ESSER money. And so that money's now gone. And then um, when the restricted revenue goes away, so do the restricted expenditures. So both of those are going to be dropping. And then we'll probably end up in 22-23 with around $1.4 million. Always taking a look at our ending fund balance where we're at. This is just a summary of all of it. The very last row here, you can see at the end of this year, we're, we're going to have around a 26% reserve level. Next year is gonna be around 28%, and then the year after, 25%. So a very healthy budget. And we always have to spend some time and talk about our other funds. And you can see here the effect of um, what has happened with COVID. Our, reserve, our revenues this year of 1.7 million for food services, that's, that's very low. And so um, we did not get a waiver at all to try to help us out with this, but we still have the same expenditures. So you can see that we're deficit spending in the food services budget by $1.1 million. The nice thing is that we had a healthy beginning balance. And so at the end of this year, we're anticipating about half a million dollars left. We're watching this fund very closely because next year we have to make sure um, that we, we kind of turn this budget back around. So, you know, knock on wood, everybody will be here, normal operations and that revenue will go back up. Deferred maintenance, 2.6 million is what we move into that and we spend that all. That money is to be spent um, to keep up all of our beautiful facilities and um, very uh, nice program that we have going on with that. Normally we only put about a million dollars into this, but because of our needs for redoing our parking lots, this year, next year, and the year after, we're actually putting in an additional $1.6 million so we can get those projects done. <clears throat> Excuse me. The reason that we're running it through the deferred maintenance is because the bond money, um, we we're, didn't get our new bond. And so we have to now start looking at what projects we have and budgeting things now in the out year. Our special reserve fund, we estimate about $2.1 million left at the end of this year. Every year, that was from the sale of Lowell High School many years ago, and every year we move about $800,000 over to the general fund, and that just supports our operating expenses in the general fund. Fund 20 is our special reserve for post-employment, or basically our health and welfare. So we're anticipating $8.5 million in that ending fund balance, um, which is just a reserve so that if we get into bad budget times, we can go to this money and use this money to pay our, our premiums. Our building fund, we're anticipating $31 million at the end of this year to be left. And you can see now we're just on the expense part of it, very little revenue coming into this. Um, it's just basically interest that we're earning on the cash that we have, and then we're spending it on all of our bond projects. Our capital facilities fund will have probably around a million dollars left at the end of this year. And going on to the next slide. Small amount of money left in fund 35. Um, we're anticipating that being spent probably by the end of next year. Fund 40 is a reserve fund that we use that we actually take money from the general fund and put it into fund 40 so that we could replace um, some of the expenses that we've, we're going to have come up because of um, the projects that we've done. An example could be uh, you know, replacing the turf a few years down the road when we need those money. Very large expenditures. So we would come to this fund and use it for those projects. Small amount of money left in fund 49. Um, fund 51 is what we use. We report that out only at the end of the year, and that's basically um, the bond funds and what we're doing with um, that. And then Fund 52 is also a very small amount. It's just for some Melarus that we collect from the Buena Park area, and then we turn around and, and pay off um, a loan for that. And then Fund 67 is our health insurance fund. 
and our workers' comp fund. And so you can see right now, we've got $4.1 million in there. I, I anticipate that going down um, possibly by the end of this year. And the reason for that is we try to keep about two years of dental insurance costs in that fund, which usually ad averages around $2.5 million a year. Um, so I, I, well, I'm sorry, $2.5 million for the two years. And so um, what we'll stop doing is um, moving money from the general fund over to fund 67. I don't adjust that budget until we actually start looking at estimated actuals because I want to get as close to the end of the year so I can really see what's happening because we are fully paying for the dental costs. So our next steps, um, we're recommending the board to approve the 2021 second interim report and we will be attending the governor's May revise and coming back and giving you any other information that we receive. Questions. Thank you very much. Any questions, Joanne? Holly? Thank you. Thank you very much for the information. Seems like every couple months, hearing either federal money coming in or state money coming in or projections. So, so I just have a few clarific clar clarification, excuse me, questions. The second interim, is that built, for example, the COLAs on the governor's budget proposal? Yes. So the first budget proposal, the governor comes out and he tells us in January. So the last in January, he told us the COLA would be 3.84%. So this budget is based on what the governor told us in January. And then the budget we build and approve in June would be based on the governor's May revise? Yes. Okay. Yes. And then what we do too is even after we bring the adopted budget to you within 45 days, if the state for any reason changes um, what they're going to give us, we come back and we give you those adjusted figures. Okay. And because these are unusual times, we hear the legislature might fund some things early. Mm -hmm. And so that would be reflected in the budget. Is that correct? Um, yes. So what I'm reporting today is as of January 31st, there's already been changes that have taken place after January 31st. So we have about $8.3 million more coming from the ESSER two funds from the federal government. We've been given that specific dollar amount. So when I bring estimated actuals back to you, the revenues for restricted programs would have gone up. Expenditures will also follow with that money too. And that's from the December uh, relief bill? That's the December relief bill. Um, I know that there's more coming our way, but at this point, um, what was recently being talked about last week with the federal government, I don't have any specific dollar amounts yet, but I'm waiting patiently so that <laughs> they can tell us what it is. <laughs> right, because I believe the latest is the House will be voting on that tomorrow, so we should know relatively soon. And all that would be reflected in the estimated actuals mm -hmm. and then ultimately into the June budget that you put together. Yes. Okay, and I'm making sure I've done my list here. That's it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I, I do have one question uh, that I probably won't be able to ask very well. I know that the district has debt relative to, say, construction of La Vista La Sierra. From what source is that debt paid? And is that reflected in this at all? So are we talking about our COP payment? Yes. Um, so it's all reflected in here. Um, we, we do have, so certificate of participation is a loan that we actually took out. And it's different than the bond money where um, bond payments come back directly from taxpayers. On a COP, the district actually makes the payment and it, it, it is reflected in this budget. So what, from what source would that money come? Well, so we end up, um, so we get some redevelopment money too, and that gets run through Fund 21, our, our bond fund. And then we look at that, part of that money goes out to our elementary districts. Part of that money we can use to help pay for that COP. And then um, we'll go ahead and make those payments. Um, if we are upside down and we've not been in quite a while, then we could use part of the general fund money to also make the COP payment. But we are depleting the fund 21 with the 
right. with the major projects that we're doing. So are so, you cautious about yes. the funds so that we never get to the point where we cannot because the redevelopment funds are not going to be sufficient? To so what we end up doing is we, um, we actually project out and yes, we watch that very closely um, because we wanna make sure well, with everything, if we're going to have an additional cost to the general fund for whatever purpose, we're going to make sure that we're going to budget in those multi-year projections. And in Fund 21, it's actually broken down where we have sub funds in there. And so we have a sub fund that only holds the redevelopment money, so we can track that easily separately. And then we have other sub funds that are just the bond monies. And so um, it's easy to, to watch it and make sure that we're okay. I, it would be interesting sometime for me, I don't know about the rest of the board, to look at the long range, mm -hmm. when this could be paid off, what will be the source of the funding. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can look like we have a nice reserve, but if we ever had to dip into that to pay some of this debt, yes, that would be not a good thing because it would impact our programs and other things. So Yes, and we work very closely with public economics. Um, he uh, goes through and gives us you know, historical information on where uh, we've been. And then he actually projects that to the future, being very conservative so that we do, we are able to go forward and track how much money do we believe that this is all going to be. The nice thing, especially after Adam just talked is our district is very, very stable. And so because our assessed values continue to rise, we, um, we very conservatively, when we're looking at the redevelopment money, increase, but a very small amount so that we make sure we're not expecting more money than what we think we're going to get. Thank you very much. And thank you for your report. Uh, relative to the CMPs, because it is on page nine, and I'm glad you asked because I realized I had a question about it. Uh, and I, I don't know if you have it in front, in front of you. Um, yeah, let me flip over. Of the, yeah. And I had forgotten to put this on my list. No worries. Oh, I should have looked on page five. That's okay. what I <laughs> so that. from 20, it says um, 2026 to 2030, and then it gives a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Is that per annum or is that total for those five years? Total for those five okay, years. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I was reading it correctly. Yes. And then um, would, let's say there's new development and um, we would get a share of that, at, at, whether it's the regular amount or potential Melrose or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. would those, would that money be able to be used for this? Um, or is that restricted to some other use since this is um, well, so, for a specific facility? So we look at our redevelopment money and we use part of that. And then we also, um, where it says on here, if redevelopment funds are insufficient to make the COP payment, we can transfer from the capital oh, facilities I see. From fund, the developer from fees. the developer fees. Okay. So those developer fees, um, we work closely with our facilities department to say what, you know, what are you going to be needing for this year for projects? But the number one priority is making that debt payment. So right. before there's any discussion of spending money, we make sure that we can pay the bill. Because <laughs> there is that housing development that is a stone's throw <laughs> from Point of Park High School. And I know we already had information uh, relevant to that. Mm -hmm. And last question, based on the presentation tonight, is there a refunding or I think it was refinancing <laughs> mechanism that applies to this? Because I do know it's a different type of debt instrument. Um, actually, I was talking with Adam about this a couple months ago. We watched this debt also to see if we wanted to refund it, um, do you know anything that will save some money for the, because this would help the district. Right. But it's um, at the po this point, this was a, a good financing instrument. And so it's not going to save any money at this point. Got it. Thank you for checking into that and thank you for the information. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. So we have an action item before us and that is the certification of the second interim financial report for the 2021 year. Is there a motion to approve? Moved by Lauren Klatsker. I'll second. Seconded by Joanne Foley. Any more discussion or questions? 
okay, Jenna Biney, I'm going to do this right this time. <laughs> Would you like to uh, make your preferential vote? I approve. Thank you very much. And Mrs. Harder? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Klatsker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jeng and Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. As uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're at the consent calendar and there have been, there are three items that we are going to pull out for separate vote. Um, and we, I think we'll take those first and then we'll do the consent uh, after we do that. So the first one is item 6.2.2, which is adopt a resolution as amended uh, to release from employment and non reelect probationary certified employees, public employee discipline, dismissal, et cetera. So um, I need a motion to approve that. I'll make the motion to approve uh, for separate consideration. The, you want to do them all as a group, right? It's no, I think we'll do them separately. Do them separately. Yeah. Okay, it's so res I'll, resolution 29. The resolution 29. I will uh, make a motion to approve resolution 29. Okay. Is there a second? Second by Vicki Calhoun. Thank you. I'll second. Okay, uh, roll call vote. All in favor? Yes, Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Klutzker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jane? Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. And Jenna, I didn't forget this time, but these are three that we didn't think appropriate for the student board member to vote on. Okay, the next one is 6.3.9, which is to approve a final settlement agreement and general release, CSIS, and the number, I won't repeat, you can see it on your agenda. Uh, I would look for a motion to approve this release. Move, moved by Lauren Klatsker, seconded by, second. by Joanne Foley. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Mrs. Okay, Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Klatsker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jeng? Aye. Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. And the last of the three is 6.4.2, which is the call for a motion a second to approve confidential pupil expulsion report number two. That's good to only have two. <laughs> uh, is there a motion to approve? Moved by Vicki Calhoun, Moved seconded by, Calhoun, by yeah. Chester Jane. Uh, all in favor, please Mrs. say aye. Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Klatsker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jane? Aye. Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next is I need to call for a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar as amended with the exception of the three that we just voted on. Is there a motion? I move. Moved by Vicki Calhoun, seconded second. by Chester Jang. Uh, any discussion or questions? Okay, Jenna, your turn for a preferential vote. I approve. Thank you. And all in favor, Mrs. Mrs. Bushy? Carter? Mrs. Bushy? Aye. Ms. Klatsker? Aye. Ms. Foley? Aye. Dr. Jang? Aye. And Dr. Calhoun? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, that concludes our meeting uh, that we're at a point on the agenda. If uh, we have any more board member comments. Oh, Joanne. I hope everybody has a wonderful spring break. I think in many ways it'll be much more wonderful than last year when we were in such turmoil and now we have hope. And uh, thank you for getting us this, this point in the year. And also congratulations again to Dr. Kaufman for her well-deserved recognition. Uh, we're very excited for you and we're eager to hear the results of the statewide level. I just wanna say, I just appreciate everything all of you principals do. I know it's been difficult during this, lot, during this COVID, but you guys do an awesome job. I am a product of the Florida and Joint Union High School District. And I just appreciate each and every one of you. I will come out and see your schools one day. I'll call or Ms. Kaufman will call and help me out and I'll come out and see you. But you guys are doing a wonderful job and I just want to thank you. Thank you. I want to thank all the viewers for attending the meeting tonight. And it's very nice to see my board colleagues, the student board member, and of course our principals and the cabinet in person. Um, definitely, I've missed seeing everyone in person, even though we're in this hockey ring. But um, <laughs> but it's it's still nice to be here to see all of you. Thank you.
<laughs> Any other comments? All right, well, I can't be the only person who doesn't say anything. So now I feel like the pressure is on. Um, as a mom of two current students, I just have to um, tell the principals that I want to thank you guys for your leadership during this time. I get a first row seat to what happens in the classroom in my son's classes. And I hear the things that are happening. And it's because of your leadership and because of the amazing teachers that we have that, um, that we're where we are and that our kids are getting the amazing education they're getting. So thank you for that. I got my statement in. Now we can all go home. Uh, everybody had fun things to say. You know, I, I had heard that the, uh, the teachers were worried that the parents would be watching the class. It sounds like you've got this front row seat and you're watching. Them. Well, I don't know about anybody else's children, but my children have two volumes on and off. <laughs> there is no volume regulations in my house. So um, if you're excited, I hear about it. If you don't like a grade, you got to hear about it. And I think that all of the kids in their class also have the same volume regulation program <laughs> problem because I hear their voices too. So that's there's fun. no choice but to hear think that would be fun I, would like to. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank everyone for the setup tonight thank you to mrs harder thank you to the our technology people and i think i have we have troy students here again we appreciate you doing this and um just an announcement to the board we had a brief conversation about redistricting today csba did a webinar on redistricting the it was it was yesterday and it was an odd time when nobody could be there but anyway i was able to it's you can go on to the csb website and listen to the whole thing you can get the handouts it was outstanding if you have any questions i think it would answer almost all of them so i listened that day and i listened to part of it again today so mrs harder would it be possible for you to push that out to us so that Yes, absolutely. Oh, and this is why she shared it, it with her. Oh, so great. She thank you. That way it's yeah, you don't have easier to, to find. On the website. Right. Yeah. Yes. Thank but you. it's uh, very informative and, and outstanding. So great. Anyway. Thank you. And Ms. Good. Bushy, let's not forget um, Mr. Scrambry. He does a wonderful job. We but forgot to Scott. To we have to say thank you to Scott. So I want to say thank you for all you do. And uh, thank you, Vicky. You do a terrific job. He's Thanks. having more fun now going to the schools and watching some of the uh, athletes perform or, or compete. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing, uh, I think I was over at Sonora last week. They had a cross country meet, football, soccer, baseball, cheerleading was out there. Um, there had to have been 700 kids running around doing something positive and uh, it was a beautiful day too. So it's nice to see the kids out there. Yes, thank you very much for everything you're doing. Everybody, the principals, amazing job. <laughs> I hope we thank everybody that we should have. If we didn't, we mean all of you. So thank you. And with that, the meeting is adjourned at um, 737.